What's going on everyone? Welcome back to another Empire Watch Club. Today I will be talking to you about my journey into the watch world, especially vintage Rolex, and then how I got out of vintage Rolex. I just want to start off by telling you guys about how I got into watches as a kid. Casio was definitely my first watch, and then it was Swatch. I gotta say, Casio and Swatch is kind of like the must-haves as a kid. My dad, uncles, grandfathers, uh, they were always into watches. Obviously they were luxury watches to them, uh, they used it kind of just as like a fashion thing, I'm telling tool. Obviously I was influenced by them and especially my mother. My mother always told me that a man must be responsible for his time. So time management is very, very important. So every man must have at least one good watch. After college, I started working. I was able to save up some money. I just wanted to buy watches that everyone else had. You know, whatever I saw, I thought if he was a cool guy, I'm like, oh, he wore a Breitling. That's pretty cool, I should get that. Or, oh, he wore Panerai. So yeah, I went out and got my Panerais. I got Breitling, I got Audemars, I got Hublot. And I realized that they were all like very big, big and chunky watches. You know, that was like a phase. And that phase ended about Six years ago, I started to become fascinated with vintage Rolex. I made some really cool friends. They kind of taught me, all these big bros. Uh, they were all watch connoisseurs. They were all big, big watch collectors. And I saw that they all had these like really cool vintage watch straps. They had like really cool tools and all these tools they would play with. And I'd be like, oh, what are you guys doing? Like, hey, that looks so cool, it's so rad. And so I started to become mesmerized. It was like a drug, it was like an addiction. All I could do was think about vintage Rolex, all right? Now, vintage Rolex, you have to go to school, man. It's, it's a proper education. This was my actual first vintage Rolex watch. It is a Rolex Submariner. 1680. Okay, this is a Mark II 1680. What I found really cool was that it was very thick from top to bottom and the top plexiglass dome was protruding. And I thought that was really, really dope. And I started to realize like all the loom plots, they became amber or they turned yellow over time. And I started to realize all the little minute details that Rolex made with each different series of old Submariners. And then I got a 5513, and then that led me into just a big, big black hole. All right, and when I say black hole, it is deep, man. Vintage Rolex, the waters go fucking deep. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what you're talking about, you can look amateur and you can sound like just a kook. And you don't want to sound like that. So do your homework, read up on all the magazines, all the books, go online, do all your research. There's so many little details. And I actually think vintage Rolex is quite dangerous. Okay, why do I say it's dangerous? It's actually because there's so many different interchangeable parts in there. So when I was looking at all this stuff, like, I mean, you gotta make sure the clasp is right, all the bracelet, the end links. You gotta see if the case has been polished or not. And then the most important part is the dial. You know, so this is, Honestly, like a proper education. If you're into vintage Rolex, make sure you have a lot of good friends that are really knowledgeable, as well as some trustworthy friends. And if you get to know dealers, you gotta buy the dealer, all right? They gotta be trustworthy. They gotta know what they're talking about and they gotta back up their products. Every time I wore, you know, one of these watches, you can tell the history behind it. And that's what made me love vintage Rolex even more. I felt like every vintage watch has a story. And that was the difference between a vintage watch and a modern watch. The vintage watches just had character. Um, it was used, it was kind of beat up, it was old, it wasn't perfect. To me, the provenance and the stories behind each vintage watch. So this watch was the gateway drug, the Red Sub, the 1680 Red Submariner. This is a Mark II, this is not mine anymore. So all of these watches here that you see, only these three right here, which I will get to later, are mine. These were all mine, but I sold all of them to friends or to other watch dealers, but they were kind enough to let me borrow it. So I did get into the Double Red Sea Dweller right here. Uh, this is a Mark IV, and I love this watch so much because it kind of looked like a spaceship, like a UFO saucer. I was really into the ocean. That's why I loved all these dive watches. Uh, 
Uh, it had the helium escape valve, and obviously the loom plots turned really amber in this rich yellow color. It was just so cool to have the back of this watch be engraved, and it said uh, Rolex patent, Rolex with a crown right there, and also just this gas escape valve. You know, you rarely see a Rolex with engravings on the case back. And these are the things that attracted me. And then, you know, I guess social media ruins it for me. You think you're special, but then you realize that so many people have the same watches. And then so I was like, hey, you know what? I gotta get like something even doper, something even more rare, something crazy. So I went out and got a 16660 Comex, the first 50 map dial, full set. I think I was too into the hype or something and I wanted to be accepted. I wanted recognition. I wanted the respect of my peers. I wanted the respect of other collectors. That was when I realized that something wasn't very healthy there and it wasn't all about passion anymore. I started to get into Daytonas. I got a couple big reds and then I realized I was like, dude, this is steep, this is dangerous. And uh, I pulled back a little bit and I started to focus more on Zenith Daytonas because I found Zenith Daytonas very, very interesting from 1988 to the year 2000. And I got really cool Zenith Daytonas from Patrizzi dials, four liners, and then the floating dials. I got myself a porcelain dial. It's so creamy and rich and all the letterings on the dial, it's just, oh so sexy and it's so beautiful but the details are so tiny no one can tell everyone just like oh it's a it's a gold rolex you know it's a gold daytona right and then you're like no it's a porcelain dial and they're like looks like a white dial like no it's a porcelain dial all right it's very rare and it's probably like three times the amount of a regular gold daytona white dial and they're like i don't get it it looks like a white dial <laughs> And then I got myself a Pave dial with emerald settings, um, hour markers, and this was a really, really gangster watch. All right, you feel like Al Capone or someone like of that status would wear this, and it's just bling the fuck out. It was really rare to find, very, very rare. I really enjoyed this, and I thought that it would look really badass, but after a while, it just, um, I guess it didn't suit me, and I couldn't really find me in these watches and I think that's where I was losing the passion and I think I was too caught up in the hype and trying to get sucked into this watch game and then sucked into social media and trying to compare and this is where I was trying to find my own niche I wanted to separate myself from other people you want to be a little different you know, that's just me. That's why I said each watch has its own story, but the person who wears it has their own story as well. And I wanted to create my own identity with vintage watches. While I was caught up in the vintage Rolex hype, I was kind of like eyeing some AP, eyeing some paddocks, especially the Nautilus. And, uh, you know, the grass is greener on the other side, that kind of feeling. I would say about five years ago, I bought my first Nautilus and it was below retail. So I started to pick up some Nautilus and I started to realize that I had an affection and I had a real passion for Gerald Genta design watches. And it took me a while and a lot of money to find what was really truly my style. It's something that when I wear, I know it's right and also it still had a lot of history. I was still into vintage watches and I told myself, just get rid of all the Rolex for now. Don't worry about it. And one day, you know, instead of trying to be a John Mayer or trying to be someone like that, I should go my own route. I have a really good friend. His name is Woody. He has a shop called Xiang Dui Lun. He found a 3700 for me. Now this 3700 is a Gelgenta design Nautilus from 1977. And this is gorgeous. I have to say, Gelgenta is a fucking legend. He is the man. I mean, his designs are so incredible. He put this watch on another level. 
but obviously he had something before this. This was my first Drell Genta vintage watch, and I'm never gonna sell it. The condition of this watch is amazing. It's almost mint. It's a part of watch history, and this is what I love about vintage watches. When you look at it, it, it speaks to you. You know, it's got like soul in it. The dial, the way it flares, like the coloring, you know, it's, it's simple. And that made me want to buy a 5402. And because I already had a stainless 3700, I didn't want to have a stainless 5402. I wanted to have a precious metal. I wanted to have the 402 BA. This watch is actually from Amsterdam Vintage Watches. Thank you to Jasper and Ruker and all the guys at Amsterdam Vintage Watches. Um, they are amazing. My wife found this for me and I actually flew out there to get it. And it matched perfectly with my 3700. This has the navy blue dial, the tapisserie dial, and it is gorgeous. And it's got factory set diamond markers. And this is super, super rare. And when I put it on, I just knew, like, this is so badass. Like, this is so different than every other A-series 5402. I think it was less than 100 that was made with this particular dial. The condition is beautiful. You know, just like I said, every watch has a story, and this one was picked up by my wife. And, you know, this one I found with Woody, so it was just like a match made in heaven. So this one was designed by Joel Genta before their launch in 1972. And this was kind of the one that started it all. You know, this was the one that brought this. So that's why I said these vintage watches have so much meaning and so much history. I'm never gonna sell these two. You know, after these two, I, I did a little more research and I realized that, wow, Gerald Genta, like, he's like the Picasso of the watch world also designed the IWC Genoa. So I got this from Andy at Rare Birds in Germany. The dial on this is a little bit different than these two, although the bracelet looks almost exactly like the Nautilus, but I got a two-tone instead, so all three are very different. The honeycomb dial with kind of like the SL, this lightning bolt arrow on the Ingenieur logo at the six o'clock, it's a very nice touch. This watch is a little thicker than the other two. It's a little more rugged. You can tell these three watches belong together. The similarities are so striking, and I just, I had to have all three. You know, these three are Gel Genta's babies. And that was when I knew my love for vintage Rolex was dead. I found my own path. Next time, I will get Ryan on and tell you guys a little bit about his journey and his watch collecting passion. And we will get Dizzy on EWC as well, so she will talk about her watch collecting story and how she wears her watches from a female perspective. And also what she thinks of me as a crazy watch collector. Hope you guys enjoyed this vlog, and I'll see you guys on the next EWC. Peace.